Oral questions. Questions are l'honorable leader d'opposition. The honorable uh, opposition house leader. Merci, monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the official opposition's leader and the prime minister, uh, would, we would like to wish a speedy recovery to the U.S. president and his wife, who have been infected by COVID-19. Given the situation, we see that there's a very fast test in the U.S., but in Canada, unfortunately, people have to wait a long time. Apparently, a, a rapid test has just been approved, but that could have been done six, it was done six months ago in the U.S. Why did the government wait so long here? Oh, Parliament Secretary, the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, 7.9 million tests ordered from Abbott ID. 2.5 million arriving in the next few weeks as late as December 31st. Mr. Speaker, we are working day and night to get these tests approved. Over 7.4 million Canadians have already been tested for COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, we're seeing a fall resurgence. We must continue to increase laboratory capacity and the number of tests done per day. We will continue to work with provinces and territories to ensure that we can do a high number of tests per day, but also have the resources to do rapid contact tracing and treatment of new cases. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. In the late 90s, Canada created the Global Public Health Intelligent Network to detect possible epidemics, and it worked well. H1N1, SARS, and Zika were all contained. But in 2018, this Liberal government changed its mandate, and as a result, Canada has relied on the WHO instead of Canadian scientists. Why did the government do this? It uh, cost Canada a lot of time. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. We were concerned by reports that uh, GFIN analysts were not able to proceed with their very important work, and we will be conducting an independent review of these changes to make sure that this vital tool continues to inform decisions to protect Canadians. Mr. Speaker, from the start of COVID-19 outbreak, the Global Public Health Intelligence Network has been a very important source of public health intelligence. The Honourable Opposition House Leader. This vital tool, as said, minister, as said the, uh, the parliamentary secretary, has been changed his mind because of this liberal government. This decision has been made by this liberal gov government, and now we have to pay this huge price. So does that mean that this government was so incompetent that they cannot recognize our own responsibility in this issue? Yeah. Oh, secretary, the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we trust and value science and evidence. We know the importance of public health intelligence in identifying outbreaks, and as I have said, we are concerned about the reports from GFIN analysts that they were unable to proceed with their important work. We have asked for the independent review, and we look forward to their findings, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Honourable Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this week the Liberal government has uh, used in their talking points over and over again the need to quote scientists. So let me quote the government's top scientist to the member across. Dr. S Supriya Sharma said that only hundreds of thousands of tests would be arriving up until the end of this year. And wow. to put that into context, Oh, close to 300,000 tests were done in Ontario alone this week. So I'd like to give him the opportunity to correct the record because I believe he just misled the House and the Canadian people. We're not seeing tests until early 2021. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Indeed, we did order 7.9 million rapid tests from Abbott ID. The first tests will start to arrive in the next few weeks, with 2.5 million arriving by December 21st, uh, 31st of 2020, and then they will continue to arrive into 2021. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. Mr. Speaker, here's the reality. There's such a big backlog in Ontario and Quebec for testing that the Prime Minister is telling people that they're going to have to miss Thanksgiving dinner, that they're not going to be able to go and visit their elderly parents in long-term care facilities. And all this could be corrected if we had the ability to test frequently and get results within 15 minutes, which is what everyone else in the world has. He misled the House. He said that these tests were going to be available now. That we know from reports today that's not happening until 2021. How many more people have to die because of their incompetence? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. 
Speaker, from the beginning we've worked very closely with provinces and territories. Our Safe Restart Agreement provided $4 billion for provinces and territories to increase testing capacity and contact tracing, with more than $1 billion going to Ontario alone. We were pleased to see the, Ontar the uh, Ontario update its testing requirements. We will continue working closely with all levels of government. Mr. Speaker, again, 7.9 million rapid tests on their way starting in the coming weeks. La de Saint -Jean. The Honourable Member for Saint Jean. Mr. Speaker, Quebec is into the second wave of COVID and restaurants and bars are in danger. These small businesses withstood the first lockdown by going into debt, but now thousands of them are at risk of going under. Yesterday, Quebec announced support for fixed costs for businesses forced to close in the red zone. Quebec is doing its part. Now it's the Fed's turn. Quebec wants them to share the cost and enhance its program. Will the government join in with Quebec's assistance? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Bloc Québécois promised elections now, if possible, if not uh, in the spring. They want to have an election on the weekend, if possible. The Bloc is concerned about elections, but we're concerned about the health of Quebecers. There were over a 1,000 cases today, seven deaths, and the Bloc's priority is to go to the polls? Is it really? The Honourable Member for St. Jean. I didn't hear anything there about assistance to small and medium-sized businesses, but one thing's for sure is that loans and debts are no longer a solution. The government has twice made promises to businesses affected by COVID, like restaurants and bars. The, so my question is, when will the federal government deliver on its promise to provide assistance for fixed costs? Last week, they undertook in the throne speech to support businesses forced to close by decision of pu public health. Will the government keep its word and take part in providing support for fixed costs so that businesses can avoid going further into debt? The uh, Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Bloc Québécois uh, was more concerned about elections. They're going to vote any th against anything we present, whether it's for workers or businesses. When any economic plan we present, the Bloc will vote against. The Bloc has abandoned Quebecers, but we never will. Mr. Speaker, COVID-19 has hit Canadian families hard, and they are struggling. The Canada's billionaires have seen their wealth skyrocket outrageously during this period, more than $37 billion. We need resources to help people. Many other countries have put in place taxes on wealth, and over two-thirds of Canadian families support that necessity. So why does this government refuse to put in place a wealth tax on Canada's billionaires? Why won't they force Canada's billionaires to pay their fair share? Here, here. Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, we absolutely believe that everyone in Canada needs to pay their fair share, all the more so as we are fighting together against a global pandemic. And that is why, in the throne speech, we committed to working to identify additional ways to tax extreme wealth inequality, including by concluding our work to limit the stock option deduction for wealthy individuals at large, established corporations, and, of course, taxing the global digital giants. The Honourable Member for London, Fanshawe. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals have ended the freeze on student loan payments, but they never helped international students or graduate students. They cut almost 40 per cent from the help low-income students got, and there's still the almost billion dollars in supports they promised through CSSG, but buried under their WE scandal. Now, with a second wave of COVID and poor job prospects, the Liberals are forcing students to figure out how to make their loan payments again. Will the Liberals commit to long-term help and, at the very least, permanently remove interest on student debt? The Honourable Minister of Diversity, Inclusion and Youth. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for that question because it's not often enough that we talk about Canada student loans. And I recall when I graduated from university, coming out of university not with only debt, but having accrued interest, which does not put our students in position to succeed. And that's exactly why in Budget 2019, page 44, you will see that Canada Student Loans, we are putting forward a plan to not only make them interest-free, but to make sure that six-month period is both payment-free and interest-free. And that's in direct response to what students are saying.
happening. And that's why exactly in the response to COVID-19, one of the first things we did was freeze interest, put a moratorium on payments. Yes, we will continue working with students and youth. Thank you. Honourable member for Red Deer Lacombe. Yesterday, the Minister of Public Service and Procurement said, and I quote, we revealed on our website at the end of July all of our contracts and suppliers. But yet, Mr. Speaker, I have a document in my hand that says otherwise. In September, the minister's own departmental staff sent an email to a business in my riding who inquired about the status of a contract they had submitted a bid for. The email clearly states that, due to the national security exemption invoked on this procurement contract, award information will not be posted online. Both of these things can't be true, Mr. Speaker. So which is it? Parliament Secretary to the Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And of course, on July 31st, as the Minister said yesterday, we disclosed supplier names and contract values for contracts that Canada has entered into for PPE and medical equipment, except certain commodities that have proved difficult to obtain and where additional procurements may be needed, hence the national security exemption. While we're not able to disclose all details regarding suppliers and contracts at this time, we intend to provide more information at a time when the current level of risk has passed and obviously, of course, Mr. Speaker, with the constant motivation of keeping Canadians and our health professionals safe. Deputy Charlebourg, Haute saint charles The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute saint charles Mr. Speaker, the Canadian Medical Association is also very concerned about the availability of PPE. Members and experts have been sounding the alarm. 54% of members are still having trouble getting equipment, and 86% are very concerned. If, is there a plan, a distribution plan? And if so, could, that, could we know what it is? The Honourable Member. This government has been focused on our response to COVID-19. We're cooperating with all levels of government to ensure that the adequate PPE is made available. Our efforts over the past six months will bear fruit and pay off this fall. We have set up parallel supply chains. We are calling on Canadian businesses again to retool and beef up their production capacity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government is needlessly using national security rules to hide which Canadian companies are being awarded contracts for PPE. Why can't we know how much we're paying for disposable masks? Why can't we know which Canadian company is supplying them? This doesn't seem like a national security issue for the government. It seems more likely to be an ethical insecurity issue for the Liberals. Why won't the Liberals tell us who's getting what and for how much? Secretary to the Minister of Public Services. Well, of course, transparency and accountability are critically important to our government, and we're committed to releasing a full account of all our procurement efforts, and we will absolutely do that for Canadians. But I don't know if the Honourable Member is suggesting that supplies that are uh, in critical shortages worldwide or, or where we are actually competing with other jurisdictions for critical procurements. I don't know if he's suggesting that Canada should uh, make public that critical information. We won't be doing that, Mr. Mr. Speaker. We, what we will be doing is strategically procuring the medical equipment, the PPE required for Canadians and our health professionals to keep us safe. Here. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute saint charles Mr. Speaker. Who's out there in the field? It's the doctors on the front lines. And they've said that masks and surgical gowns are necessary for each and every interaction. That was true before. before that was true even before the current surge in cases. So there's a problem, and doctors are concerned. So we want more transparency. What is the plan currently to protect Canadians? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, we are working and we're very confident in our plans. We're confident that our efforts over the past six months to generate our supply capacity around PPE and medical equipment, we're confident that those efforts will continue to pay off for Canadians. I don't know if the member opposite wants this to fail, but I would say that our guardian angels when it comes to supply procurement, our inspectors, our regulators, they are also our guardian angels who are protecting us, and we thank them. We're very confident in them. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Jacques Cartier. 
Mr. Speaker, we are now in the second wave of COVID. I'd like the Minister of Procurement to assure us that the problems with uh, procurement of uh, PPE and equipment have been corrected. There was some a constituent of mine who's, uh, who, who was lost in the system during the first wave. Can the minister ensure us that uh, liberal cronies are not being f given f preferential treatment? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. We are working hard right now, Mr. Speaker, to ensure continuity of supply to our health professionals for all Canadians. We have set up a parallel supply chain. And of course, we are calling on everyone who believes they can supply us equipment or services that will help in the effort. We would ask them to indicate that they are available to help us out, and we will continue to build Canada's capacity to equip itself with this equipment. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg. It's a bit strange. A Liberal, former Liberal, gets a contract, but in our writings, no contract. But Frank Bayliss, a Liberal, gets a multi-million dollar contract. Can the Liberals tell us whether contracts are going to their cronies, yes or no? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The Minister of Innovation delivered the good news the other day by saying that 50 percent of supply of procurement is currently within Canada. Calgary, who are supplying us with hand sanitizer. We can thank enterprises like Lumen Ultra in New Brunswick, who are providing us with reagent. We can thank businesses from all over the country that are calling, that are heeding the call to action and coming to the rescue of Canadians and our health care professionals. They should be ashamed over there. The Honourable Member for Joliet. The government house leader just showed disrespect to my colleague because there are a lot of businesses in the red zone in Quebec that are in danger of going belly up. Could the minister just answer my question out of respect to these businesses that have to close for a month and might go under? Will the federal government join in Quebec's program to support fixed costs? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, there are times in history where leadership is recognized, and, and this is seen in how a party reacts to a crisis. The Bloc has failed on that score. The Bloc wants to make sure that the elections don't occur after the spring of 2021. What if there are more cases in the spring of 2021? What if more Quebecers are still looking for work? Their priority is to go to the polls. That's profoundly disappointing. The Honourable Member for Joliet. Mr. Speaker, I'm speechless. A government needs the government's, needs the House's confidence but the, gover the government should at least answer the question out of respect for bars and restaurants that are in danger of going, going into bankruptcy. He just wants to play petty politics. But those businesses are in danger. The federal government should partake in Quebec's assistance program to cover fixed costs, because the federal programs, the criteria are all too restrictive. So my question is, what is the government going to do? Do they care about these businesses at all? The Honourable Government House Leader, as I said before, Mr. Speaker, while the Bloc gets ready for the next election, we're taking action on behalf of our businesses and our seniors and our workers who've lost their jobs. We are working for restaurants and tourism. Those are concrete ways of responding. They can always get ready for the next election as much as they like. But meanwhile, we are going to have the backs of Quebecers. Mr. Speaker, the second wave of coronavirus is turning into a tsunami because the Prime Minister has failed to get Canadians rapid testing. And this is insane because the Parliamentary Secretary to Health actually has a rapid testing company in his own constituency wow. in Dartmouth. This wow. is crazy. Either the Prime Minister wants the economy to completely shut down, people to miss family dinners, or he's just 
blindly incompetent. These tests aren't coming because of their failures. Which one is it? Oh, Parliament Secretary of the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, every step of the way, as I've said, we have been at the table with our provincial and territorial counterparts to help them respond to COVID-19. We've been very clear with every jurisdiction that testing, contact tracing, and timely data are key to responding to outbreaks. Mr. Speaker, not only have we provided billions of dollars through our Safe Restart program to increase capacity of testing, we have also ordered 7.9 million Abbott tests, rapid tests that will begin arriving in the next few weeks with 2.5 million of these tests here by December 31st. Here, here. Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. That's months away. This guy has a rapid testing company in his own backyard and didn't even think to raise it with the minister months ago. You know who this impacts? The elderly. What the Prime Minister is doing with this is saying, Long-term care facilities have to be locked down. Aging and elderly people have to stay in their homes. That's the only tool we have because we can't frequently and rapidly test each other. Why, why has the Prime Minister allowed becoming elderly or being aged become a prison sentence in Canada? The Honourable... Somebody? Not sure who's... The... Honourable Minister, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Safety. Well, of course, as an integral part of our plan to safely restart our economy, we're securing the testing supplies, including, as my colleague says, up to approximately 8 million tests from Abbott ID now to meet our needs now for the long term and increase our capacity to test more Canadians. But, Mr. Speaker, what I'm perplexed about is we spent six months procuring the equipment that we need, and we're confident about that. We spent six months uh, uh, building our domestic capacity. We've spent six months assisting and, and being side by side with our provinces. What is it about yes, yes, and yes that they don't get over there? Honourable Member for Kildonan and St. Paul. Speaker, Sherry Santiago is dying of stage four cancer. Her dying wish is to be reunited with her sister, her best friend, be, to be by her side in her final moments. But her sister is in the Philippines and has been denied entry into Canada by this Liberal government. Surely there is a way we can ensure Sherry and her sister are reunited safely. Canadians are tired of the talk and endless promises of details to come. They want answers and they want them now. Where is the compassion? Where is the plan? Honourable Minister of Immigration and Refugees. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since we introduced a process to reunite families last June, we've been working on ways to address additional families and compassionate cases. I know it's been a long and challenging wait, but we're working very closely with health and border agencies and across federal and provincial governments to find solutions. I know that cases like the one like my honourable colleague just mentioned are inspiring our work, and we hope to have more to say very shortly. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kildonan St. Paul. I think inspiring is the absolute wrong word to use. So, Mr. Speaker, the Liberals have been announcing reuniting families for months and still nothing. Canadians deserve the dignity and clarity of timelines. No more details coming soon. Donna McCall was dying of cancer and her her children were denied entry into Canada. As she took her last breath, her husband held her hand and in his other hand had his children on FaceTime on his iPhone. This is not the Canada I know. The Liberals have allowed billionaires on private jets into this country, but they won't allow people who are dying to be reunited with their loved ones one last time. It is unacceptable. Where is the plan? Minister of Immigration and Refugees. Mr. Speaker, if my honourable colleague was listening, what I said was that the cases like the one she'd mentioned were inspiring us to continue to reunite as many families as possible. And on this side of the House, we do believe in compassion, but we have to exercise that compassion responsibly. We will always stand up for families when it comes to our immigration system while not compromising the health and safety of Canadians during the pandemic. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, this year was the worst returning run of Fraser River Sockeye in recorded history. The Minister can't both promote open net salmon farms and claim to be a protector of Pacific wild salmon. Salmon. Open net pen farms increase the risk of disease and sea lice in wild salmon. By choosing to defend these farms, the minister is ignoring local and indigenous knowledge and the Cohen Commission, a $36 million scientific study. When will the Liberals make good on their promise and remove the promotion of open net fish farms from the Department of Fisheries mandate? The Sure, we got the Honourable Minister or Parliamentary Secretary. <laughs> 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Wild Pacific salmon is a priority for our government to British Columbians and to all Canadians. So I want to be very clear. Our government is committed to transitioning away from open net pen fin fish aquaculture in British Columbia in a responsible way. Part of that responsibility is to consult meaningfully with affected First Nations, and that is exactly what our government is doing. We also need to work with the province of British Columbia, as we know all parties want to see a plan that is timely, workable, and economically feasible. We are doing that work, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for South Okanagan and West Kootenay. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to hear that the government will support regional airline routes that are essential for ridings like mine. We know airlines are going through a tough time, but I want assurance that any direct support also require that the airlines provide refunds for travellers who have been given only vouchers in return for cancelled flights. Every MP has heard from travellers who now have vouchers worth thousands of dollars that they may never be able to use. The Minister passed a law that clearly states passengers must be compensated in cash. So while supporting airlines, will he also support everyday Canadians? The Honourable Parliament Secretary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for the question. We've heard from all of our constituents across the country the concerns uh, that our constituents face, and no Canadian should have to choose between uh, paying for rent and having income insecurity as a result of um, unable to receive refunds. Um, the Minister's office continues to work with um, airlines across the country uh, to ensure a solution. We will continue to work with them and hope to have more information uh, in the coming uh, in the coming weeks and months. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Fleetwood Port Kells. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Honourable Minister of Fisheries, Oceans, and the Canadian Coast Guard. Can the Minister update the House and fisheries stakeholders in British Columbia on the Minister's response to recommendations 18, 19, and 20 in the Commission of Inquiry into the decline of sockeye salmon in the Fraser River, the Cohen Commission? which called for an evaluation of the risk to wild Fraser River salmon posed by aquaculture operations in the Discovery Islands and a decision by September 30th, 2020 on whether or not they should continue operations in that area. The Honourable Parliament Secretary to the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for the question and for his work on the Fisheries Committee, and specifically on his recent work on wild Pacific salmon, a subject that we both share a passion for. I want to be very clear. Our government is committed to transitioning away from open net pen uh, fin fish aquaculture in British Columbia in a responsible way. Part of that responsibility is to consult meaningfully with affected First Nations, and that is exactly what we are taking the time to do. The Honourable Member for Megantic Lérable. Mr. Speaker, 108 uh, workers uh, in Thetford Mines, 130 in Thetford, in another area, are deprived of half of their pay since May because they are falling between two different programs despite repeated requests by my office to the minister's office. Some five months later, they're still waiting. I would put a hashtag incompetent. When will the government give them their full salary so they can pay rent and for their food? Lab. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Please turn on your microphone, the Honourable Leader of the Government. Mr. Speaker, the government is doing everything it can to help our workers, to help people who have lost their jobs, uh, starting with uh, the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit. Uh, now we're moving towards EI so that no one is left behind and we're there for people in need, and we will continue to do that. Uh, the Honourable Member for Meganti Clérable. Mr. Speaker, we're talking about a transition that they want to make, but they couldn't even make the transition that they should have made five months ago. How are these people going to pay for their bills with half their pay? I'm talking about uh, people who are waiting and trusted the government. They continue to wait, and they're only getting half of their pay for five months, five long months. Uh, it took a lot less time for the government to help out its friends at the Weed Charity. When will these workers get their pay? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Employment. 
Speaker, we recognize the urgency of the situation, and that's why our government has taken action to support workers and their families. In August, we announced the next steps in our government's plan to support Canadians through this pandemic. Our plan includes a seamless transition to EI, coupled with the creation of new benefits to ensure that no Canadian worker is left behind. Last week, we introduced legislation to create these benefits. Our goal during this transition from emergency to, to recovery is to provide Canadian workers with the certainty and comfort they can count on over the long term. No matter what stage or phase of recovery communities are in, we will leave no worker behind. The Honourable, the Honourable Member for Bose. Mr. Speaker, the government's current plan is not working with a pandemic. We have to make internet development a real priority. We have to ensure that uh, young people can have access to education. This is important. We're talking about regional vitality. When will the government will sit down with the CRTC and have a real internet deployment plan and put in place and ensure that all the telecommunications company contribute? It's important, Mr. Speaker. Honourable, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for his question, his very important question. I live in a rural area, and I really understand that Internet is no longer a luxury, it's an essential. We know in the last six months, many people have worked home, they've done their classes from the kitchen table, they visited their doctor's appointments online, and accessed other government services remotely. So it's important more than ever that all Canadians have access to the Internet. And as confirmed in the throne speech, we are going to accelerate the connectivity timelines and the wonderful ambition of the Universal Broadband Fund to ensure that all Canadians, no matter where they live, has access to high-speed internet. Thank you, Mr. President. The Honourable Member for Tobique Mactaquack. Mr. Speaker, with the rise of working from home and schooling from home due to COVID-19 in much of the country, access to strong, reliable internet is more important now than ever. The quality of internet service continues to rise in our urban centers, while places like Borden, Carleton to Fernwood in the heart of Melpec, Prince Edward Island are left behind. This is just another example of the Liberal government ignoring rural Canadians. When will the Prime Minister listen to the current concerns of rural Canada and ensure that all Canadians have access to quality broadband internet? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to Minister of Rural Economic Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to echo my comments to my, my colleague across the way. I too understand the importance of connectivity and how we need to move forward. I'm delighted that we've connected just over a million homes in the last, um, in spending million dollars, we've, oh my golly, sorry. We've connected over a million homes in our last program. We're all looking forward to the new Universal Broadband Fund, we're excited with the partnerships that that can avail of to connect rural and remote communities, to leverage money, and of course with the announcement the other day with Canadian Infrastructure Bank, that's a $2 billion investment to connect, to connect more than... The Honourable Member for Jonquière. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government House leader seems to have developed a new narrative uh, that we want an election and not to collaborate. I know that the cultural industry has suffered hard during the pandemic, and perhaps I can refer him to a quotation from his uh, colleague, the member for Mac Malpec, who said that Canadian taxpayers uh, are not uh, a, a, a bank machine for Quebec. I can tell you that we're not getting enough money. I have a simple question, and I don't want to hear about an election. I don't want to hear about collaboration. Can the Minister of Heritage commit to ensuring that the Quebec cultural sector has immediate and direct access so that they can pay their rent and fixed costs? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I know the importance of culture, and I was myself uh, privileged enough to be Can Minister of Canadian Heritage. Uh, and yes, we will be there for the cultural sector, Mr. Speaker. But I was asking my Bloc Québécois colleague the question. I have a lot of respect for them. They do good work, but they said they would never vote for the government again after yesterday. So uh, will they vote no if we – will they vote no on, on this, like everything else? The Honourable Member for Manicouagan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I understand the Bloc Québécois' exclusive loyalty to Quebecers, and I – we could talk about elections outside the House. Of course, the Bloc Québécois is exclusively loyal to Quebecers. What's good for Quebec 
And if it's brought to the House, we'll vote in favor of that. Uh, so let's clarify that. To start talking about culture, we have just asked for a clear answer. Our museums, our theaters, our concert halls are in the red zone for the next uh, 28 days. They'll be closed. Uh, owners of these spaces are having difficulty. This means that our artists still cannot make their living. We know that culture is very important to Quebecers. This is part of our identity. <laughs> The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, the Bloc Québécois is not Quebecers. We have to understand that Bloc Québécois is just a political party with its strengths and weaknesses. That's it. It doesn't represent all Quebecers, Mr. Speaker. They can't speak on behalf of my colleague from Louis Saint Laurent or from uh, the other MPs who represent other parts of Quebec. Uh, the Bloc Québécois is for the Bloc Québécois, period. What I want to know, Mr. Speaker, is they decided to s watch the game from the bench. Member for Regina Leuven. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Former Liberal Dan Mateague recently released a study that revealed the Liberals' new fuel standard, dubbed Carbon Tax 2.0, will increase home heating costs by 60%. Drive up the price of fuel by another 13 cents will cost 30,000 jobs and will remove $22 billion from our economy. To the Minister of Economic Development, why does our, your government continue to wage war on hardworking men and women in our energy sector, manufacturing sector, and agriculture sectors across our country? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our government has put in place an ambitious climate plan that is doing more to cut pollution than any other plan in Canada's uh, history. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we're also uh, putting more money in uh, Canadians pockets. Uh, the clean fuel standard represents a massive opportunity to create jobs, attract investment, drive innovation, and ensure Canada is producing the things the world wants well into the future. Canadians expect climate action now, Mr. Speaker, and that is what we will deliver. Well, member for Regina Lubin. Mr. Speaker, this has nothing to do with climate action, and I've figured out what their actual priorities is. Today, they posted a job for $90,000 for a storyteller and team lead in the PMO. In the middle of p the pandemic, is that your priority? You want a storyteller to tell the stories of this prime minister? It's shameful. What? When <laughs> thousands of people in Saskatchewan are looking for jobs for months and people are paying their mortgages with their line of credit, your priority is a storyteller for your unserious, unethical prime minister. You should be ashamed of yourselves and get a real plan for jobs in our country. Yeah. Just uh, remind the honourable member to uh, direct his uh, questions uh, to the chair. Uh, the honourable parliamentary secretary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, all we hear from the Conservatives is what they are against. They are against putting a price on pollution. They're against having cleaner fuels. They're against having a real climate plan. Mr. Speaker, we know we have to take climate action now. Canadians know this. The world knows this. It seems the only people that don't are the Conservatives. The Honourable Member for New Brunswick Southwest. Mr. Speaker, two weeks ago, the Natural Resources Minister told CBC News there's no path to net zero carbon dioxide emissions without nuclear power. The Minister gave every impression the Liberals' throne speech would commit added research and development to small modular reactor technology. This is also a priority for New Brunswick government. Yet the throne speech was totally silent on SMRs. Does the government consider SMRs to be part of the country's clean and affordable energy, energy solution, or is this minister just out of the loop on national energy decisions? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to answer the question. Certainly, small modular reactors have a wide range of potential applications are emissions-free and could be an option for communities that choose to use them. In 2018, a steering committee, including provinces, territories, and power utilities, submitted the SMR roadmap. To date, we have seen a clear interest and in initial action taken to advance this technology in a safe and responsible way. The safety of Canadians and the protection of our environment remain top priorities for both our government and industry regulator, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. We have more to say about this, and we are very excited about the possibilities that the SMR sector is presenting to Canadians. Merci, Monsieur le Président. 
L'honorable député. The Honorable Member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic has upset many aspects of our lives. Our government has been there to ensure that no one faces the pandemic alone. Our government has provided significant benefits, such as the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit, the Canadian Student Emergency Benefit, all this at a time when the public service had to make a considerable effort to work remotely. Can the Parliamentary Secretary or the Minister of Digital Government tell us uh, what the government and how the public service have adapted to provide these important services to Canadians. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell for his hard work and for that great question. More than ever before, we've seen the important role of the digital government during a crisis. Our government has increased uh, capacity of IT system to meet uh, quickly growing uh, demand for digital public service and telework uh, through tools such as the COVID-19 benefit search and the COVID alert uh, development that normally would take months and years took just a few weeks. Our public servants are amazing. We have shown that we have provided good quality digital services that are faster and more reliable that will improve the lives of Canadians. Lona Lake Country. Mr. Speaker, it's been another summer where my constituents have not been able to utilize the Okanagan Rail Trail to its full capacity. A section of the tra trail is closed uh, due to uh, the factor that the federal government has delays in administering an addition to reserve, and people dangerously have to divert onto a highway. This decommissioned sea and rail project is a model of cooperation between our local municipal governments and thousands of donors and volunteers. I wrote the Indigenous Services Minister months ago with no response and my constituents are getting frustrated. When will the minister resolve this land transfer? The Honourable Parliament, pardon me, the Honourable Minister for Indigenous Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm glad to sit down with the member and brief her further at another occasion, for sure, Mr. Minister. Thank you. Honourable, the Honourable Member for Battle River Crowfoot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Businesses across Canada are struggling in their recovery. I hear from many about SEBA, their frustration with applications, delays on changes that were promised long ago, long wait times, and even the MPs are being barred by officials to even ask for help, especially when Liberals only seem to respond to our questions with condescension. That is not enough. To the Minister, when can we expect this small business lifeline to be fixed? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you for the question, and Mr. Speaker, I would never be condescending to any member in this House, particularly to members talking about our small businesses. I absolutely agree with the member opposite that now, at the time of the coronavirus crisis, they need our support. We committed in the throne speech to enhancing SEBA, and we are very hard at work on that. We'll have more to say very soon. We also committed to further support on fixed costs and to targeted support for businesses facing new lockdown measures. All of that will happen. And thank you for the question. Honourable Member for Markham Unionville. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The York Regional Police have reported busting a multi-million dollar illegal casino ran by organized crime in Markham. These types of operations fund the drug trade, human trafficking, and the dirty money they make is protected with their brutal violence. Liberal policies are soft on crime and hard on communities. These policies are failing the GTA. That is why organized crime is thriving. Mr. Speaker, why won't the Liberals take organized crime seriously? The Honourable Parliament Secretary. Well, Mr. Speaker, if yeah. I may, um, uh, first of all, let me be very clear that we take the threat of organized crime, transnational organized crime, money laundering, and the activities that the member described very, very seriously. Um, I'm a little bit uh, perplexed. By, by the member's assertion now, because when he, he and, and, and the Conservatives were in Parliament, 
they cut the resources to the RCMP. They, they, they closed all the integrated proceeds of crime units. And police services, excellent police services, like the, uh, the, the York Regional Police Service, have always relied on, on a, a well-funded uh, support from the RCMP. That's why we've been working so hard to restore the capacity of the RCMP to participate fulsomely and to lead Canada in the fight against organized crime. Mr. Mr. Speaker, we will always stand resolutely to ensure that our yeah. officials have the resources they the Honourable Member for Cumberland Colchester. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Parliamentary Secretary of the Minister of Fisheries. I sit in the unceded traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq in Nova Scotia, and each year on October 1st, we celebrate Treaty Day to honour the peace and friendship treaties between Nova Scotia's original Mi'kmaq First Nations and European settlers. My constituents in Millbrook First Nation, as well as the Mi'kmaq across the province, would appreciate an update on the current nation-to-nation -nation discussions underway between our government and the Assembly of Mi'kmaq Chiefs, based on their treaty rights to fish for a moderate livelihood, which was upheld in a ruling on the Marshall decision. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Fisheries. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question and for the excellent work she does in this place on behalf of her constituents. Yesterday was indeed Treaty Day and it reminds us of the important work that still needs to be done in honouring the peace and friendship treaties signed so many years ago. Under the Marshall decision, First Nations have a constitutionally protected right to fish in pursuit of a moderate livelihood and implementing this decision is critical to the work of reconciliation and is a priority for our government. The Minister continues to have conversations with First Nations leadership and will continue to work collaboratively to fully implement their treaty rights. Honourable Member for Churchill, Kiwatanek Aski. Mr. Speaker, today we are reminded that COVID-19 can hit anyone, anywhere, even the President of the U.S. We also know that First Nations are disproportionately impacted. One of the biggest challenges for First Nations is how do you self-isolate when your house is overcrowded during a housing crisis? Every day, Indigenous people are forced to leave their community for essential services. For communities now in lockdown, like York Factory, people are stranded. What actions is this government taking to ensure that people can safely remain outside their community for their health and that of their First Nation. The Honourable Minister of Indigenous Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for this important question. I, it, I would like to update her on the recent cluster of cases in York Factory. Uh, a rapid response team has arrived in the community a few days ago, and they are, they are uh, ensuring that the, that, the, that the community members that are affected are isolating and that we are tracking and testing cases. Uh, we are cautiously optimistic about the outcome and the safety of that community at this time. Obviously, we know that uh, Indigenous communities face these barriers and continue to face these barriers as a second wave hit, and we will move aggressively to, to deploy surge capacity and ensure isolation, whether it's inside or outside the community, to avoid that important vector of transmission that can be caused with inter-community uh, travel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honour to rise in this place to raise an issue that I think has not been raised here before, and that is that imminently the United States military plans to start bombing within the territory of our southern resident killer whales. It's called, very benignly, the U.S. Navy Northwest Training and Testing Activities, but it will include uh, use of torpedoes, bombs up to 1,000 pounds, explosives, testing underwater drones in our shared waters. This government has said nothing. The state of Washington has protested. When will this government deliver a clear message to the U.S. Navy, do not do this in our waters, do not wipe out our southern resident killer whales? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to the protection of the marine environment and have made significant investments over the years to protect southern resident killer whales. Canada's Navy has always been a strong steward of the environment, has taken action to cease training operations in the area until we can assess the situation. They have also had procedures to limit impact on training on wildlife. We will continue to work with the Department of Defense and our counterparts in the United States on this important issue. That concludes our oral questions for today.